Good day everyone, and thanks for tuning in to our second Indie Spotlight of 2018. If you're new to the channel, I'm Sarks. Welcome. This month we'll be covering just about one of the coolest remakes ever, Wonder Boy, The Dragon's Trap, by the dev team Lizard Cube. I put out a poll for this on Twitter, and well, it mostly got lost in everyone's feed. But to spice things up, I added another game to the list, which turned out to be Wonder Boy, which, in case you hadn't noticed, wasn't among the three in the last video. Well, that got the most votes, so I suppose it's time to finally gush about this game. To start off with some background, Wonder Boy The Dragon's Trap, as I've mentioned before, is a remake of a game before it. This game, known as Wonder Boy 3, and bearing the same subtitle, came out for the Sega Master System in 1989. The original game's premise was simple, and was accessible even to those not familiar with the first or second game. Starting off, you play as Hugh Man, aka the Wonder Boy, who is on a quest to raid the castle of the malignant Mecha Dragon, who apparently holds a dangerous secret. You fight him, and upon defeating him, you are cursed thenceforth and are turned into a beast called Lizard Man. The game then opens up, and you are tasked with lifting this curse from yourself, surmounting a number of challenges that have the spirit of Mecha Dragon haunting you, turning you into various kinds of monster kin. Oh, and the relic you seek that apparently can lift your curse is referred to as the Salamander Cross. Never quite understood why they mixed a Christian symbol with a moist lizard and called it their cursed lifting relic, but I'm sure there's some weird Japanese reason for it. In any case, Wonder Boy 3 is probably the highest rated game in the series, with Wonder Boy and Monster Land coming close behind it. And it's certainly no mystery why they just had to remake it. Wonder Boy 3 is probably the most diverse with regards to gameplay, aesthetic, and music. Now, if you're like me, you like a pretty detailed story. There's truly nothing like a lore that just enthralls you with the imagination of its creator. Thing is, Wonder Boy actually has a pretty simplistic story, only really starting to explain itself in the second game. Wonder Boy, or Human, or Tom Tom, is apparently from a place called Wonderland, which has seen a number of difficulties. For one, there's a mad king that rules nearby and occasionally steals girlfriends. Hence the first game's story. Second game, word spreads of Tom Tom defeating the evil king and they dub him Wonder Boy, both after his heroic deed and to name him after the land. Suddenly, years later, Mecha Dragon takes over Wonderland, infesting it with his minions and killing off most of its inhabitants. The place is then renamed Monsterland. Wonder Boy fights his way through Monsterland and makes it to Mecha Dragon's castle. Hence, now Wonder Boy 3, the Dragon's Trap. As a final security measure, Mecha Dragon, expecting to be defeated, lures Wonder Boy into his lair and curses him to distract him from his quest to take back Wonderland. And I guess, just so we're clear, Tom Tom, or Wonder Boy, is also human, but I'm guessing he's only called that in the third game to more easily distinguish him from his other animal forms. But yeah, that's about it. Nothing really beyond this. Everything in the game is really just imaginative fantasy, but that's something I adore it for. When games nowadays need to always, like, break the mold or reinvent genres and things, it's nice to sit down to a perfectly simplistic little story like this and feel like an age-old hero. That isn't to say that this game isn't innovative, though, because it was probably one of the most innovative games of its time. The ability to change into different animals and learn different playstyles was only echoed in prominence once Shantae for the Game Boy Color came out in 2002. With regards to its level design, the levels are particularly labyrinthine sometimes, and there are tons of secret locations to explore. Just like some of the older Castlevania and Metroid games, you may have to do some backtracking for additional secrets, but that kind of thing is A-OK -okay to me. I hate it when you have an open-ended game with little reason to return to areas you previously visited. In this game, you'll never really see any particular area only once if you're trying to go for the gold. Gameplay-wise, as I said, if you've played Shantae before, with the exception of Pirate's curse, the transformation mechanic will immediately seem familiar to you. The game also features a weapon and armor system that gives you general stat boosts for attack and defense, but sometimes gives you abilities necessary for progression, like the ability to swim in lava or destroy bricks. There are even some weapons and armor that have secret abilities that aren't explicitly defined, and sometimes these will help you locate some of the trickiest collectibles in the game. There's certainly a lot of Castlevania influence here, so if you're familiar with classic Castlevania combat, this should be right up your alley. 
A number of critics have praised the game for its influences, usually stating that it takes the best parts of these other games and makes them original. On to the presentation. Well, since I'm discussing the Lizard Cube Indie re-release, I'll be referring to Michael Geyer's revised soundtrack and the new hand-drawn visuals. The music is just brilliantly composed, and absolutely addicting to listen to. Back in the day, Wonder Boy 3 got a number of reviews saying the same, that the soundtrack could be easily listened to by itself with some headphones. Michael Geyer's rendition of the original tracks does the same, but I think it'd be more appropriate to say that his tracks need a stinking auditorium to really shine. The level of precision with which the original soundtrack was recreated is astonishing, and I am thrilled that they included some behind-the-scenes filming of the recording sections. This kind of musical talent is unparalleled. He nailed the feelings that the original composer Shinichi Sakamoto was trying to achieve in 89, which is most likely due to the fact that Sakamoto actually oversaw the production of Geyer's revival of his work. And the new music accompanies new visuals, of course, and they complement each other fantastically. The artwork for the entire game is done by Ben Fickett, a quiet French artist whose work has an incredible stylistic range. Every character is animated incredibly fluidly, and the world he's rebuilt from the original is breathtaking and alive. Really, the only worthy complement to his work is the accompanying soundtrack. The art style captures the charm of the original and refines it in a masterful way, breathing completely new life into a game that feels familiar enough to the original to stay firmly planted in its roots, but it explores this world in enough new detail that leaves you speechless and amazed. Probably my favorite sequence in the game is running across the plains with the track Adventure Zone playing, and then entering into a strange, magical forest right when the violin picks up and starts emphasizing the atmosphere in perfect synergy. Of course, if you're looking for a completely classic experience, the developers actually included the ability to toggle the old graphics on, as well as the music and the sound effects. I've always been a fan of this kind of support. I thought it was done masterfully in remakes like Halo 1 and 2 Anniversary, and I think it's just as seamless here. Oh, and one last thing before I wrap up. I seem to have forgotten to mention this earlier, but they added the ability to play as Hugh Girl, which is pretty fantastic because her design is great and kind of implies that it was Tanya, Wonder Boy's girlfriend, that ended up saving Monsterland. But Tanya's hair was green. Hmm. Well, Wonder Boy's hair color changed to green, so I guess continuity isn't so important, but they're just legends. Interpretations, right? Go watch my Zelda analysis videos, they're pretty interesting, okay, thanks. Anyhow, if you're uh, on the fence about buying it, really do take the leap. It's such an enjoyable experience. If you've played the original, then there's even more reason to pick it up. Even not having played the original myself, I got massive amounts of enjoyment out of it and was hooked for a good two weeks trying to get 100% on my save file. Lizard Cube needs more recognition for this, and you can certainly help them grow by getting this title on a platform of your choice. They even said their dream remake to be given the Wonder Boy treatment would be Zelda 1. So, if you want to see that happen, which why wouldn't you, Zelda 1 would look amazing with Ben's artwork, support the crap out of these guys, and maybe Nintendo will finally authorize an indie developer to deal with one of their properties. Sega did it with Mania, it certainly isn't out of the question. In any case guys, thanks for watching. If you want to see one of these games for next month's Spotlight, be sure to let us know on Twitter or in the comments below, or perhaps offer your own suggestions as to what we should Spotlight next. See you in the next one! The level of precision. The okay. The level of precision. Uh, no. Hello. Hey, I am good. 
my week has been fine. The food. Huh. Okay. Uh, yeah. She told me. Alrighty. Bye bye. Gotta pick up some food at my mom's house, I guess.